I'm sending warm greetings from England to Pilgrim. It's really exciting that you're celebrating this anniversary. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the origin of how we made that decision. I was installed as senior pastor in September 1996, and soon after I was installed, Rich Giblin came to me and said, we've been wrestling with this open and affirming question, and I haven't been able to make progress on it. Would you start again? And I said, um, the church doesn't know me. I don't know them. Give me a year to 18 months so that we can know and trust each other, and then, yes, we'll, we'll try again. So uh, after about a year or so, I was doing some exploratory reading, found a book, the title of which I can't remember, but it had, I think, a sheep and some other medieval kind of look at the front. Um, that was about discernment versus decision-making, and we had collected a task force to look at ONA, and we read that book, and we <laughs> decided we want to discern rather than debate and decide we would discern whether it was the will of God that we would become open and affirming. And I remember doing, a, we did a kind of a skit in a worship service on a Sunday that involved a tug of rope at one point and maybe something like a circle dance um, to dis demonstrate the differences in different kinds of decision making. Uh, that, that task force came up with about a nine month program of uh, evenings and times when we could get together and look at what the Bible had to say. We had special speakers. We had people come in and talk to us about how to talk to children about sexuality. And we had targeted a date, I believe in March, I think it was March, that would be a day of discernment for us. And on that day of discernment, we got together. We It was a very structured day. We had asked Joan Crawford, who was a, a member or a, an adherent to Pilgrim and a Quaker, to be our discernmentarian. And she uh, helped guide us through this process where we spent some time in small groups doing some Bible study and conversation. Then we had an open mic in the sanctuary. And I remember in particular a couple of very moving moments, one when an elder uh, or church council deacon, a deacon came and spoke uh, about her daughter being gay and what the family had, um, how had the family had responded and how how challenging that had been for uh, some family members, uh, and she had never told any of us that before. And then I remember Cheryl Capp standing up and saying, you know, we cannot discriminate against people by because of things they have no control of. You know, I, I know about that, and we can't do that anymore. Uh, and um, at some point in the open mic, our discernmentarian Joan said, I don't sense that we're coming to a consensus. And then it was what I call the Pilgrim Pentecost. It was as though a sound came like a railroad train from the top of the sanctuary. People rushed up to the microphone and they had, they said, no, no, we want to be open and affirming. And we quickly crafted a statement uh, that was not the most articulate one uh, to become open and affirming and decided that by consensus. And it was, it was an astounding day because I had no idea at the start of that day how we were going to end up. So... That's what I remember, and it was one of the highlights of my life, and bless you and keep you and keep on going. to reflect a little bit about the aftermath of our um, Pilgrim Pentecost. Uh, not long afterwards, we had an arson threat. Um, and that morning, and I, of course my fear was this is going to really uh, be difficult for folks because it happened so quickly after we had publicly announced our discernment. Um, but remarkably, our whole church went into the chapel on the Sunday morning, which at the time the Metropolitan Community Church was renting, and we just surrounded uh, people in that with our prayers and our love. And um, 
spent some time with them that morning as a reassurance that we stood in solidarity with them. And the peculiar thing about that arson threat is uh, we actually got television and radio coverage for our stance, which was a wonderful thing um, because it, it just made the light shine brighter. And then for me, the most moving moment was, um, I don't know how long afterwards, I don't know if it was months or over a year, but it was on a Sunday morning and it was when we were baptizing, I think we were baptizing Jeffrey Sadal's boys, I think. Um, and we were standing and I started weeping, I couldn't stop weeping. And because I sensed the presence of Jesus standing next to me as we baptized those boys, uh, that it's welcoming his people home, just welcoming his people home. And that feeling um, of standing alongside Jesus, welcoming his people home, has been something that's um, empowered and motivated me ever since. So um, our decision gave me a lot of gifts, and I know it's given the world a lot of gifts.